Hello, and welcome to the story of a sample. Today, we are going to go through and find out how a sample is prepared and put into the mass spectrometer machine at the Prime Lab at Purdue University. If you haven't watched about the research of this done at Prime Lab, go back and check the first interview with Mark Caffey. Uh, and today, though, we're actually going to see the machines that they use to pound up, uh, well, we won't see the machines to pound the sample, but the machines they use to analyze the sample. And we'll also take a look at how the sample is prepared. Today we're going underground. We're going down to the prime lab to where they look at different radioisotopes. They gotta have this huge machine that accelerates particles. Well, we don't have enough space for it in a regular building, so here we're gonna be, gonna be underground. In fact, we're gonna be right underneath where I'm sitting. And the goal of, of uh, my studies is to understand or try to determine how long this rock was exposed to cosmic rays. Now the reason I want to know that is if I can determine how long it's been exposed to cosmic rays, I will know how long ago a glacier retreated and left this rock where it was. So the bigger picture here is that I'm trying to reconstruct glacial chronologies in the Himalaya. To learn what I want to learn from this rock, we're going to have to take it apart. So the things I want to analyze here are beryllium-10 and aluminum-26. Beryllium-10 has a half-life of about one and a half million years. Eventually, what I want this rock to look like is something like this. Now, you might look at this and say, how are you going to get to here from here? But it's very, very doable. So the first step in the process is going to be that we'll crush this rock. So this will be done in a rock mill. And once the rock mill is done with it, it will be in pieces that are less than the thickness of a dime. So this is a good example of that. So this is a crushed piece of granite, and you can see that it has a lot of different kinds of individual minerals in there. Some are very light colored, some are very dark colored, and where we want to be is right here, very light colored, so this is pure quartz. So to get from here to here, we're going to have to do a lot of work. It turns out that minerals can be separated from each other using a variety of techniques. One of the techniques is that different minerals dissolve at different rates in acids. So we're going to use acid dissolution to help us out. Another technique is that some minerals are more magnetic than other minerals. And then finally, the different phases may have different densities. So quartz has a very uniform density. Other things that might have iron or, or uh, magnesium in them maybe have greater density. Other phases may have less density, so we can, we can use density as a uh, technique for separating things. For a typical rock, the way we would start is by running this through a magnetic separator. So the way you could think of this is just passing these minerals down through a chute. The chute's in close proximity to a magnet, and then the minerals that are highly magnetic are going to be bent toward the magnet. The minerals that are not magnetic are just going to go straight through and not be deflected at all. And then we would have different beakers collecting these different phases at the bottom. Then we start with the chemical separation. The chemicals that we use would be hydrofluoric and nitric acid. So we would mix some, a little bit of, of the rock after it comes out of the magnetic separator with a mixture of these acids and heat makes the reactions go better. So we want to heat them. The other thing though is we don't want the rocks just sitting on the bottom of the beaker and then having some sort of a crust form on them and that crust prevent the reaction from proceeding. So we want to keep them agitated. And the way we do that is to use hot dog rollers. So they're in beakers. We set them on the hot dog rollers. The hot dog rollers are uh, heated. So it served, the hot dog rollers serve to both keep things agitated and heat the acid so that the reaction goes a little bit faster. This is what we will end up with. And typically, we can just look at this and see that we're close enough. If we don't see a lot of dark phases in here, we know we've got really pure quartz. So now we have purified quartz. And our goal is to get the beryllium-10 and aluminum-26 out of this quartz. Now, there's a lot of quartz here, but there might only be 100,000 or so atoms of beryllium-10. So we're going to have to dissolve all of this rock to get all of the beryllium tin out of it. Now one of the things we're going to want to do, since we only have 10,000 or so atoms, 
is we are going to need to add some stable beryllium, so beryllium that doesn't decay. And we'll do that at this step. So we'll mix the rock, we'll mix the uh, acids, and we'll put our stable beryllium tin carrier in with the solution. Then we'll dissolve the rock. We'll take that solution and run it through many, many steps of dissolution. And in the end, all we'll have left is beryllium, that that we added, plus the 100,000 or so beryllium tin atoms and aluminum. Perfect. So we've now pounded the beryllium tin, which is the radioisotope made by Cosmic Rays, and the beryllium 9, which we added to the solution of, uh, before we dissolve the quartz, into the cathode. Our goal is to measure that ratio, beryllium 10 to beryllium 9 ratio. So to do that, we use a technique called accelerator mass spectrometry. The ion source is where we're going to get the sample out of this cathode. So to do that, we will aim a beam of cesium atoms at the surface of this. And you can think of this as, as uh, a collision process. This is the injector magnet. The injector magnet is used to inject the beam into the accelerator, but it serves another purpose for us also. It separates the beryllium-10 from the beryllium-9. To accomplish that, it has to bend both beams around a 90-degree corner. These are called Einzo lenses. All they do is catch the beam that's diverging as it leaves the magnet and then focuses it back to a point again. Okay, this is the accelerator. There's a couple of things you might notice about the accelerator other than its color. The first of which is its size. And the reason the accelerator is so large is because it is actually an insulator. So inside the accelerator itself is nitrogen and carbon dioxide, which serves as insulating material. The thing that it's insulating are the accelerator tubes, which run down the middle of the accelerator. If the accelerator itself is running at 7 or 8 million volts, the beryllium-10, as it exits the accelerator, will have nearly 30 million volts of energy. The beryllium-9 and 10 are separated in this large magnet at the exit of the accelerator, and the 10 goes down the middle of the beam pipe and proceeds on to the detector. The 9, by virtue of having less mass than the 10, is put on a tighter radius of curvature and we steer it into its own detector where we can determine how much 9 is in the beam. The beryllium-10 has to proceed on down the beam line. Now since there are so few beryllium-10 atoms and there are still contaminants in the sample, we have to still perform several stages of mass analysis. The only thing that's left are those ions that have mass-10. So that would be beryllium-10, but unfortunately there's another nuclide that has mass 10, and that's boron. So we have to tell the two apart. And the way we can do that is by having both go through a gas detector. This detector enables us to count every atom of beryllium 10 in one at a time. So the gas detector lets us know how much beryllium 10 was in the sample. The other detector that we use for the beryllium 9 gives us the beryllium 9. We can get the 10 to 9 ratio by simply dividing one number into the other number. Now you might be wondering what is that ratio for typical samples like a, a quartz sample from the surface of the earth and it turns out that the beryllium 10 to 9 ratio is around 10 to the minus 13. In other words for every 10 to the 13th atoms of beryllium 9 there might be one atom of beryllium-10, which is the reason we had to use the different detectors to start with. Once we know this ratio, we can multiply that ratio by the amount of beryllium-9 we added to the sample to start with, and that tells us how much beryllium-10 is in every gram of this quartz. Once we know that, we can figure out how long this quartz was exposed to cosmic rays. And, if I have done everything correctly, I can know how long ago the glacier retreated that left this boulder where it was when I found it. Oh, well, welcome back. I hope you had fun learning about sample preparation and how the machine works. 
So let's just review quickly. You start with a rock that might have a small trace amount of beryllium in it, and you have to break it down into a lot of parts and only extract out the things that contain the beryllium, in this case, the quartz, okay? And once you have that, you dissolve it up, and we add a little bit of uh, beryllium-9, the stable beryllium, so you can keep track of everything. And then you take the 9 and the 10 beryllium's, right? Dissolve those up, put them in a machine, and uh, smack it with some cesium atoms, get it up there and accelerate it so it has a little bit of charge, and start sucking through that long tube of machine. You can bend it and focus it with magnets, and we use electricity and charge to build up to accelerate to really fast speeds. And when we get to the end of the long beam, it turns the final corner, and the beryllium 9 makes a really fast, tight corner. Okay, that's what most of the beryllium is. And the beryllium 10 makes a longer, slower corner. And then we go through one more long tube uh, to distinguish uh, that beryllium 10 from anything else it could be. And in particular, we're trying to make sure we don't have any boron 10. All right? And so once we know how much beryllium 9 makes the sharp corner, and we can find out how much beryllium 10 we had that took the long route, and got rid of everything but beryllium 10, we can get that ratio of beryllium 9 to beryllium 10 and since we know how much beryllium-9 we put in the sample, we can figure out how much beryllium-10 started in the sample. And from this, once again, right, tells how much beryllium tens in the rock, tells you how long it was exposed to cosmic rays. It'll tell you how long a rock was exposed on the Earth, or it'll tell you how long an asteroid chunk, meteorite chunk, has been circling around uh, the sun before it landed on the planet. So, hope you learned a little something today. I had a lot of fun touring the lab, and we'll see you next time.